now in its ninth year, this is GabNet, the great American broadcast network. Talk like you've never heard it before. This is Alex, and this is The Ramble, and we go until midnight tonight from New York, New York. Larry Bubbles Brown has never been married, and and uh, I think uh, I think you're lucky for that, to tell you the truth. I, I think it's the one good decision I made in my pathetic life, yes. Yes, one, <laughs> one, one pathetic life. Uh, I got one thing right. <laughs> you got one thing right. Yeah, well, you know, I've been married four times, uh, and I'm going to keep doing it till I get it right. You know, four. I didn't know that. Wow. Yeah, yeah, four, four times. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite a quite a thing. I'm 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 kind of happy for it. So I wound up with a pretty good marriage this time. It's going to last because where are we going to go? We're so close to death. That, well, you know what uh, you got going in favor of your marriage is that you've got such a big place, you can get away from each other. Oh, yeah, we do have the room to move. There's no question about that, you know. And, uh, it, uh, you know, um, we, we if, if she's mad at me, I simply go into the guest room and watch television, right? Or yeah. I, I, or she can be working in the kitchen and I can be in the office, you know, so... Really, it, we do have the space to get away from each other here, which is very lucky. It was very lucky during COVID. I mean, God, you know, that was, if you survived that, you could survive anything. Right. Yeah. But anyway, so we, we you know, that, that we, 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 we get along somehow. I, and I don't know. She just told me, say, say, a couple minutes ago, she told me to go fuck myself. You know. <laughs> Well, do you think it's normal for people, for people to be together forever? No, I don't. Not at all. I not no together. Yes, monogamous. No, I was talking about this to Lori. Monogamous. No. Uh, monogamy. I, monogamy is unnatural for uh, I, humans. I think uh, monogamy is unnatural for humans. Not unnatural for coyotes. You know, coyotes mate for life. Uh, and and doves. Doves. Mm-hmm. Really? That's the other species? There may be more, but I knew I were uh, I, 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 I've heard of a couple, and that's it. I mean, but human beings are not on the list. Okay. No. Uh, and so I don't think we're meant to be necessarily monogamous. Uh, as I said to Lori again, and I've said on the air in a number of times, I think it's the male's job to inseminate the herd. <laughs> you know? I mean, really, think about it. In nature, uh, are, are animals monogamous? No, except for the ones we mentioned, they're not. You know, and we're, we refuse to believe we're part of nature, but we are. Now, I think you can live with each other for the rest of your life. That I believe. I believe there are relationships. I mean, Marjorie and I, I think we have a very good relationship. But now, because in the old days, I would have cheated on her. And she couldn't stand that. But I, <laughs> but I argue that being bothered by your husband cheating on you is an ego, ego thing, you know? Because if all the other factors are good, I mean, you get along with each other and you, uh, you have sex on a regular basis and you're, uh, uh, you know, you, you, you're there supporting each other and so on and so forth in your needs emotionally, then, you know, so what if the guy is cheating? All the other things are there that the other woman isn't getting. You know, so... Well, uh, some people have open marriages. I don't know that I like that concept particularly. I mean, that means that it then forces you to go out and cheat. All right? Uh, I just think you should have an, uh, uh, an idea that when one or the other uh, finds, uh, finds somebody where he wants to put his penis... Uh, uh, that should be um, tolerated, just as a it part, of, just as a part of nature, and that that's that's what guys do. Okay, women don't do it. See, women are more protective about themselves. 
because if they have sex, there's the problem of pregnancy, for instance, and then they're going to become a mother, and then they're going to have to take care of that kid for the rest of their lives because husbands can run away. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think women are just being more protective of themselves by wanting to be monogamous. Yes. That's why women are more selective. When, when That's why when, men we pretty much will bang anything that moves. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. Yeah, if it if it moves, yeah, or if it's got a pulse, we'll uh, we'll <laughs> we'll do our thing. I I really believe that. I think that uh, I think monogamy for men is insane, and to impose it upon them is unnatural. Uh, but uh, but to say that you're going to be loyal to somebody, I mean, loyalty is different. You know, where you put your penis doesn't amount to loyalty. That yeah. amounts to some kind of comfort for a moment, you know, or satisfaction. But it has nothing to do with caring and and uh, loving and all the other things that a relationship is about. Uh, well, we, men are cursed with our this stupid sex drive. So then you get in a relationship and you feel guilty for looking at other women, which is perfectly natural for you to do. Well, I I, I felt you know maybe I'm wrong about this, and tell me if I am, Bubs. But you probably won't tell me I'm wrong on this. That the whole a movement, the whole Me Too movement was anti-male you know it was attempting to say that because males are acting out their uh, natural predilection yeah that they uh, they therefore have to be considered uh, horrible human beings and terrible human beings you know like no, I, in the case of Harvey Weinstein they were right well in the case of <laughs> yeah but the Harvey Weinsteins are very rare you yeah. know I mean come on not everybody out there goes out and you know rapes uh, 50 women, 100 women, or uses his power to do that. That's that's a rare thing, not a, not a normal thing. But it got to a point where anybody who did something wrong at one time in his life was all of a sudden losing his work, his job, his, uh, his income, his living, right? Yeah. Uh, maybe his marriage, any number of things, and over something he did 20 years ago. You know, when there was a different set of rules. Uh, I mean, I always had my set of rules, and my set of rules were always to never do anything to make somebody else feel uncomfortable. And so, therefore, I couldn't be a Harvey Weinstein, as an example, because he didn't care if he made somebody else feel uncomfortable. Um yeah, I probably they probably that type of person probably likes making them feel uncomfortable. But. Yeah, but nevertheless, I I think back on my time in San Francisco. I was talking to Lori about it today, uh, and and uh, I I don't know if back then because I was a real horn dog back then. Would you describe me as a horn dog back then? Well, you got you you had your share, yes, but we yeah. all were. Yeah, we were all horn dogs. Okay. But how many? And we the, had, uh, and being in the, being on the radio or being on stage gives you a little extra advantage. Yeah, huh? You're funny. Let me uh, you know, yeah. bl- let me blow you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it, you know, it, yes. I mean, we had a certain privilege there, but the fact was is that I'm thinking back. You know, I, I, there's so many women I had sex with. I can't remember. I can't remember them all. But could one of them come forward and say something about me just because I had sex with them? You know, I never forced any woman to have sex with me. They did so willingly, uh, you know, maybe sometimes out of pity, you know. Uh, but, uh, I mean, I don't, but I, I just wonder if there, if, if there was some woman that could come forward and say something horrible about me. And I think there probably would be some nutcase out there, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, uh, it, it, I'm I'm lucky that I'm not on the air right now because there's nobody to say, oh hey, and back then he uh, he took advantage of me, you know. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> it's so funny that, uh, and then and then Bill Cosby. <laughs> it's always like the guys that have these. Uh, wonderful uh, reputation. Yeah, oh, he had a wonderful <laughs> they reputation. They turned out to be the worst. Well, everybody kind of knew that about Bill Cosby over the years. It wasn't like it was a big secret, you know? Uh, 
they knew that he used pills and things like that to get women comatose enough to have sex with him, which I don't understand because this is a guy who was a good-looking guy. He was a funny guy. He was an accomplished guy. He was a wealthy guy. He had all the things you could tick off as being reasons why women would want to have sex with him. And why he felt he had to drug them in order to have sex with them is beyond me, unless he liked them comatose when he had sex with them. Because he could have had sex with any of them without giving them a pill. You right. Know what I'm so well, I don't. That would be an interesting uh, psychological study. Of, yeah. Uh, there must have been something about making women comatose that was enjoyable for him. Yeah. Uh, and. Uh, you know, I you know I believe that he did what he did. I'm, I'm not going to argue with the women who say he did. Well, I'm going to argue with. I'll say maybe it was a percentage where we're telling true stories and the rest were lying. Okay. I think yeah, people come out of the woodwork trying to get money or uh, publicity. But, but if too. one if one was absolutely believable, that's all you need to say yeah. this guy is terrible because you just don't treat a woman that way. Yeah. So, but, uh, you know, I mean, think think about your past. I mean, are there, are there women that you know that could come back to haunt you on something like that? I don't think so, and I've got all the canceled checks to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's our Bob. We were talking, uh, also, Lori and I, about um, uh, whatever happened to Bobby <laughs> Bitter. <laughs> Bobby Bitter was, uh, it just kind of ran out. It kind of, it was funny for a while, and then I think, uh, it got, plus, plus I did it with David Pell. It's hard to do anything as a team. It's just not easy to do that, and it, uh, I thought it had some funny parts. We did it on your show several times, and, uh. Yeah, yeah. And then a bit just, just kind of faded away. Bobby Bitter was, uh, Bubbles' alter comic ego. Mm-hmm. Right? Bobby Bitter's stand-up comic, is he? He was like a legendary old comic, yeah. And uh, based on, a lot of it was based on the uh, way Jerry Lewis acted. We found some interview that Lewis had. He, he just told, <laughs> Jerry Lewis apparently was not a very nice person. Oh, he was, I saw, there's an interview that's on YouTube, okay, where some guy's interviewing him. I think from like the Hollywood Reporter or something like that, and he—I guess he just instantly took a disliking to him, and so any question he would ask him, he would only give him a one-word answer. You know, Jesus. Have you enjoyed being in show business all these years? Yes. And uh, there were people that uh, apparently he got a little maybe. Uh, I know Harvey Weinsteinish with uh, women, but uh, there were rumors of that effect with him. Well, I do. Do you not believe it? You know, uh, he was the kind of person. Absolutely, I, I, I think was, uh, well, shall we say, pushing himself on people. You know, uh, but nobody's out to get him today because he's dead. He's dead, but he had the. Uh, he was hugely famous when he was twenty-one. Mm-hmm. Yep. And yep. his Jerry, and this I noticed as a kid when uh, Jerry Jerry Seinfeld said Jerry Lewis had the greatest hair in show business. <laughs> he really did, to tell you the truth. Yeah, because I remember when I was a kid and I loved him. I I remember thinking, God, I wish my hair looked like his. And it stayed that way pretty much all of his life. Until he was like, yeah, ninety-one or whatever he died at. Yeah. Yeah. He still had the hair, and it wasn't a hair piece. Definitely no. wasn't a hair piece. Just great hair. Yeah, uh, the greatest hair in comedy. Yeah, I'll agree with that. Jerry Seinfeld had pretty good hair, but he's you know it's it's getting soft now. It thinned out. Yeah, yeah but thinned Lewis out. kept it till he died. Jeez, that's amazing. And you remember? Did, uh, did you ever meet him? No, never met Jerry Lewis. Never did the telethon. Did the telethon, but I did it in San Francisco. And uh, he wasn't in San Francisco. He was like in Vegas or someplace like that, you know. And then they would do breakaways to the local stations, and I and I was involved in those on a couple of occasions. Then I kind of gave up on doing telethons. 
because I uh, I did do the I did do the muscular dystrophy anytime they would ask because what I checked after a while uh, was uh, how much these companies these organizations how much money went to their infrastructure and like how much they paid their president and vice president. And if all of that was it was more more than uh, oh say thirty forty percent of the take, then I wouldn't do the telethon. And I found out that with Jerry Lewis's telethon, it had the largest amount of money going back to the charity of anything. In other words, Jerry Lewis didn't take a penny for it, as an example. Okay. And the heads of the comp uh, of the of, uh, of muscular dystrophy. Well, I mean people who who go into work every day and keep a company going should get paid, okay? That, that I'm not arguing. But, you know, to pay them millions and millions of dollars a year, eh, that's not a good idea. Yeah, there are so, a lot of charities that so they I keep always, like 90% of it. So I always base what charity I did on the amount of money they raised and the proportion of the money going back to their administration. And uh, the only one that came out really good was uh, muscular dystrophy. So I would always do muscular dystrophy. But I had done cerebral palsy, and I had found that cerebral palsy, something like 40% of their money went to their infrastructure, their administration, their president, and so on. A lot of money they got. Yeah. And uh, I, I just didn't see that as being worth it. But I did their telethon. And I use a perfect example of their telethon. I always was bothered by, did you ever see Dennis James, who was the host of the telethon for years? And then no. he, he would have kids come out and start dancing with cerebral palsy. Oh, God. <laughs> and they would sing to a song, look at us, we're dancing, look at us, we're prancing, or whatever. Uh, look, we got cerebral palsy, but we can do this. Okay. That, that's not the lyrics of the song, but that was the the nature of what they were doing. And I always thought that was in horrible taste because kids were falling over, you know, and things like that. And I just thought it was just a horrible thing to do. To, it was exploiting the kids. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, so I, but I did, was decided to do the one, and they said, Come do this telethon this time because it, we were changing the look of the face of telethons, and I went, oh, okay, I'll do it. You know, and I went, and went down. I think it was at KPIX in San Francisco, and the person says to me, "Now look, uh, we the little lecture we like to give everybody. We don't re refer to these kids as handicapped." And I said, "Well, that's very nice." He said, "We refer to them as handicapable." <laughs> And I said, and that's not as bad as handicap. <laughs> that worse. You know, it's worse because you're being, uh, what do you call it? What's the word? I'm condescending. Condescending. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they're handicapable. I'd say, okay. And uh, also, uh, you know, we're trying to just, we're just trying to do something different here. So I go out there, and the host, I can't remember who the host was, says, uh, there's this whole thing about the face of telethons and how they're trying to change the face of telethons. And I'm in front of all these uh, people on the phones, and one of them is a guy by the name of Hugh Romney, who was known as Wavy Gravy, right? Uh, and he was there in a clown outfit, all right? <laughs> uh, he, and he was with the hog farm. He was fairly well known. Still is. I mean, he's dead, I think, but people still remember him. And uh, I knew Hugh, and um, I, I so I get up there and I say, uh, "Hi, everybody." I'm reading the teleprompter. Right? Hi, everybody. I'm Alex Van. Blah blah blah. blah. Uh, I welcome to the cerebral palsy telethon. We're trying to have a new, put a new face on telethons. And then I turn around and point to Hugh Romney. <laughs> <laughs> in this clown outfit. I just, it was the worst telethon I ever had to do. And I decided from then on, screw cerebral palsy. I don't care if these kids can't walk again, I'm not doing it. And I, and I, but I made sure I did muscular dystrophy. I was always there for muscular dystrophy because A, they were very professional, they were very nice. 
And I liked the way they raised money. And then Jerry, even with the kids, you know, was not condescending in any way. He didn't he didn't treat them like they were somebody to be pitied. And I like that. So I and uh, and he stayed up for twenty four hours or something. <laughs> well, you know, my other classic story about the telethon is is that in New York I did this. I was doing a radio show in New York, and one night I talked about Jerry Lewis, and I said, you know, I really think he, as a performer he has something to be desired because by that time he wasn't even funny at all, you know. But he has a <laughs> lot to be desired. But I gotta say, you gotta you gotta give it to him when, for, on the muscular dystrophy thing. I said he's raised a lot of money and he does it in a very dignified way. Well, it seems the radio station had a problem. Somebody had reported to the FCC that somebody on one of the sh- other shows had said uh, said something nasty about them, and that they weren't given the opportunity to reply because there was an equal time provision in those days. And so anytime anybody was put down from that time on by any of the hosts, they wrote that person a letter. And really? so they wrote a letter to Jerry Lewis <laughs> saying, Dear Mr. Lewis, Mr. Schbenick said you had your talent had a lot to be desired. If you'd like to reply to this, please get in touch. See, then they were off the hook with the FCC if Lewis were ever to complain. Well, we let that drop and Time goes on. Finally, it's time for the telethon, right? And I always, I never watch the whole telethon, but I like to watch the last ten minutes when Jerry would get down there and he'd sob a little bit and say, "Oh, we just made all the money we had to make," and he looked like he was really tired and worn out. And then he would, at that point, he would finish the show off by singing, "You'll never walk alone." You'll never walk alone. <laughs> Very dramatic. Yeah, and. I'm looking at the TV set, and he says, by the way, I'm dedicating this tonight to that disc jockey in New York who thinks I'm not that good. <laughs> and I look, I think it was my wife at the time, I look over at Susan, and I go, he meant me. He's singing this song tonight for me. Because it couldn't have been anybody else, you know. And uh, by the way he described it and everything, and uh, because they sent him a transcript of what I said, uh, and they, he's saying you'll never walk alone, and it was dedicated to me, and I felt so proud of that moment that I had accomplished something in my lifetime <laughs> that I made Jerry Lewis react to something I had said. Uh, but uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I have, uh, did you ever like Jerry Lewis? You ever think I he loved was him as a kid? Yeah, I loved him as a kid. But the minute I grew up, I didn't like him anymore. Uh, is I, it, it? I liked him through my through my twenties, I think, and then. You know, he was funny for the times. By today's standard, he wasn't that funny. I mean, you know, you, you just watch Jerry Lewis back on the old Col- Colgate Comedy Hours, and yeah, they're very funny together. But uh, he uh, he's a little over the top. You know, yeah, his uh, he had a couple of movies that were uh, Nutty Professor was funny. Oh, great picture, great picture. You know, but that's it. That's pretty much it. The stuff he did with Dean Martin, the movies were kind of like terrible. The, the the nightclub act was supposedly terrific. You know, and the two of them on stage together just incomparable. Uh, but when he went and started, you know, doing when they started doing those movies, they were basically just ways to push Martin and Lewis, you know, because they'd been so big. But the movies weren't that good, you know. Uh, they're always pretty much the same film. And Martin, the reason he left the team was he got sick of playing the same part every time. He said, you know, so he was the one that broke it up. Yeah, he said, I've had it, you know. That's it. In fact, uh, the uh, the delicate delinquent, which Lewis did bring out with somebody else starring opposite him, uh, was the picture that broke them up. Because he Martin looked at the film, and he said, "I'm not even. I, I don't need to be in this film. I'm not important to it." You know, 
they get me to sing a couple of songs and that's it you know and I he went that's it I'm out of here so they made the movie without him mm. and uh, he went over to MGM did a couple of, one picture called uh, 1000 Bedrooms or something like that and it wasn't very successful. It wasn't very good. But then he did The Young Lions, which was a dramatic thing he did with Marlon Brando. And I think maybe Montgomery Clift. I'm trying to remember who the other person was in the film. I think you're right. And he was not a bad kind of a natural actor. And they, he did very well, as a matter of fact. And everybody said, okay, Dean Martin is, is more than just Jerry Lewis's organ grinder. You know, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they used to say. The whole whole act they said was just an organ grinder and his chimp. Hey, listen, we've run we've we've run out of time here. Gosh, how time flies when you're having fun. Let's do another one next week, okay? Yes, we, I'll be the chimp. Oh, uh, he'll be the chimp. Bye bye. Now in its ninth year, this is Gabnet. The Great American Broadcast Network. Talk like you've never heard it before. I pushed the wrong button and then that came up. And what I wanted to have come up was this, but instead uh, it didn't. It just uh, came up like that. So anyway, hello. How are you? What's doing? How you doing? This is Friday already. It's the end of our uh, end of our work week. Pretty pretty uh, simple work week we have here. And uh, let me see here. Uh, we got just two people waiting to come on right now. But usually it, uh, it gets better than that. But we'll see what happens here. Let me, uh, let me bring them in here. There we go. There they go. Oh, wait a minute. I got, I got to get rid of something here. I don't understand. I, I, you know, I, don't, I really don't cover all my bases and um, uh, so consequently, see, that's not Chuck Farnham. That's actually our good friend, uh, Charlie Wallace. But it says Chuck, Chuck Farnham, and I've got to get rid of that. Hold on a second. Because I was doing that earlier today. And, you know, it was, uh, it was um, a thing we did earlier today. So anyway, here we are. How are you all, everybody? Are you doing okay? Yeah, let me see here. Oh yeah, and there's uh, there's Josh, and there's Charlie, and there's Jeff. Okay, Hello. if that's all that ever called tonight, that would be a great group of people. Okay, so uh, <laughs> nah, let me have some some lemonade here. Uh, it's a good thing. Hmm. Yeah. Good. Lemonade flavored seltzer. In fact, they say classic lemonade. Mm -hmm. Well, ca classic lemonade has rinds in it and seeds and all kinds of things, you know. But uh, so, how you all doing? How you doing, Charlie? Mm -hmm. How's the weather down there? It's still hot. It's still hot. How hot is it? So hot that I saw a squirrel rubbing lotion on his nuts. That's those, yep. remember it's those? that hot. You remember those those Letterman uh, Letterman jokes? Yeah. yeah. It was so hot. I saw a squirrel in Central Park, and he was rubbing lotion all over his nuts. That would be the line. And if it was really cold, uh, uh, you know, I saw a, a squirrel in the park, and he was warming his nuts. <laughs> and they could get away with it because, after all, they were referring to the nuts that squirrels collect and eat. So. Yes. <laughs> That was nice. And hello to Josh. Yeah. Hello, Josh. How are you doing tonight? Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I imagine that you're chomping at the bit because uh, n next May 20th, our uh, ex-president goes on trial, and that will be a first for this country, won't it? Uh, yeah, it will. Yeah. Well, well, I mean, it's not just the, uh, the thing that was happening in New York, which is... Uh, um, uh, question of um, what you reported as being expenses and things like that because you paid off a hooker. This mm -hmm. is actual crimes, high crimes and misdemeanors. Yeah, yeah. Did so. they did they set the date for the one in New York? Did mm -hmm. I 
Am I not remembering that? I don't know if they did or they didn't. I think they did. I seem to vaguely remember that they the did. One, the one in Florida, really, that I think that's a little bit too far out, to be honest with you. I don't really think it should be 10 months for them to get ready. But maybe he has this other one that I'm just not remembering was scheduled or whatever. I, I'm not sure. Well, I, I don't know that uh, that's that far off for a trial. I mean, when I was going through my, when I was going through my stuff, they were setting them that far in advance. You know, right, right. It, it could be just you know. I can't imagine that this judge has a big workload. You know, she doesn't seem like the one they throw a big workload at. Well, right. I mean, the federal criminal courts are, you know, not nearly as backlogged as your state mm -hmm. criminal courts. You know. Um, yeah. So really, I think ten months in a federal court is a little. Well, they uh -oh. like to do things fast down there, and this is not fast. Well, right, I agree. I mean, you know, I mean, maybe I completely misunderstand the situation or the timeline. And like I said, maybe I'm forgetting that he's got something else scheduled between now and then. But to me, that just seems like it shouldn't be taking place that long from now i mean uh, three or four months i think would have been plenty of time for both sides to prepare their their cases and then let's you know get it over with i mean there's no sense yeah but to i think i think there is out. um there you know right that's right at the at the end of the primary season yeah right yeah yeah, yeah. uh yeah man yeah pretty much yeah yeah so yeah, at uh, that point, if he's nominated, is he then going to complain that he can't uh, he can't be uh, 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 in court if he's running for office? I mean, oh, I'm sure that he will. Right? You know, I, I just generally <laughs> in my life personally, maybe I'm not as good as this stuff as he is, but typically when I have had something at my work that I really needed to be there for. Mm -hmm. um, I tried not to commit any federal crimes, you know, between <laughs> that time. So, I mean, you know, I mean, so, but, you know, maybe he's got a beef. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but he's, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's just, I think he's in a lot of trouble. I think that we're going to see another indictment uh, next week or the week after that. If, oh yeah, I don't, I don't know if that'll be when it is, but I'm sure there's more coming. I mean, there's certainly... I can't see any uh, scenario where both of these other two major cases come out and say, "No, nah, we, you know, we decided not to to do anything there." I mean, I'm sure at least one of them is going to move forward, um, but I'm not sure. I mean, you know, the January sixth one could uh, still under investigation, and uh, you know, the, the, that could be a, a big one, you know, and I, I mean, like I heard Phil last night acting like because Giuliani didn't get some letter that, you know, he's 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 good to go now or whatever. It just no. means they haven't mailed him one yet. Well, they were they're, not, they're only required to mail a letter to somebody when they're planning on prosecuting them and indicting yeah, I mean, them and prosecuting them. And uh, that's why Trump got his. They probably didn't do it for Giuliani yet because they haven't settled what they're going to do with Giuliani. All right, that's what I'm saying is it, it just doesn't, I mean, they, they don't have to be done, mm -hmm. you know, unless and, and unless they were going to charge it under a conspiracy wrap with all of them at the same time anyway. Mm -hmm. um, the Giuliani case could be severed totally separate from, yeah. you know, any, any uh, Trump issue. So... The fact that he wouldn't get one at the same time might just, it doesn't mean he didn't commit some other crime and be charged with separately. You know, the only reason they wouldn't inform all those people at the same time is if it was under the same case. Uh, you know, the exact same case, you yeah. know, I, yeah. I assume. So, yeah. you know. So, it, it, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I think he's going to be up to his ass in litigation by the time he runs for president. Oh, yeah. I mean, he's, he's going to be tied up with that non-stop really for the next two years because each of these trials takes weeks to whatever and you know there's all time I well, mean, what, yeah. ha what happens if yeah. he's then president of the, let's say he's president of the united states i don't think there's a possibility of that but i said that the last time okay mm -hmm. uh but let's say uh he's president of the united states mm -hmm. they can still go ahead with the trial can't they 
Sure. Well, they can. Well, and then if they find him guilty, can they send him to jail immediately? Sure, they can if they want. So we would then have a, a president who was, well, the Oval Office would be an oval cell? Sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, there's nothing constitutionally to prohibit it. And well, you know, take him I out of what, office and the vice president would take over. You know, but I, I mean, that, you know, I he doesn't even have to do that. I mean, you'd like to think that the cabinet would, you know, would uh, would take that step and and declare that, you know, I mean, they probably wouldn't. Uh, somebody asked the question, yeah. uh, if he becomes president, again, another if, big if, mm -hmm. because even the polls say that it doesn't look very good that if he went up against Biden, he would win. OK, mm -hmm. but the big if he wins. Uh, and then he gets convicted. Mm. Can he pardon himself? I don't think he can, no. Oh, okay. Because everybody keeps asking that question. I mean, there's there's no specific statute or constitutional provision that says that he can't. Okay, but there's also not one that says that he can, mm -hmm. which means it's going to come down to inter interpretation, and someone's finally going to have to make a decision on that because <laughs> the idea of this was practically unfathomable. Which is why I believe that he can't. I mean, it's it's a, you know, I believe it's a completely ridiculous notion. I personally have never believed in this garbage that you can't prosecute a sitting president. You know that oh you, you got to wait till I mean, listen, I spent many many days and hours, weeks, months of my life in the in the notes and the journals of the Constitutional Convention mm -hmm. and the letters of the delegates and and more. And I think I know these people decently. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, I don't. I think that's something that we made up. And if that's what we want as society, fine. But I don't think they would have liked it. And I think the idea of the president pardoning himself, any president would have had people like Adams and them just. I mean, he, you know, he fucking go ballistic. They, I mean, they'd give the country, <laughs> they give the country back to the king. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it, yeah. It, that's the kind of stuff that I, I think that that's how that would look. Right. Correct. Yes, Alan. Mm -hmm. uh, we in, we investigated Nixon while he was president. Well, well they no, investigated. I mean, they can they do that, you know, all the right. time. Well, the, but, the, no, <laughs> the investigation of Trump happened while he was in office. He got yeah, impeached he, twice. Yeah, investigated. Right. And he got impeached twice. I'm just saying, you know, the DOJ has said, you know, and then the Repu everyone keeps arguing this deal that they've got this, you know, Department of Justice memo that they were wrote in the 70s or whatever that just says, you know, if you investigate the president and you found out he committed a crime, uh, whatever crime, federal crime or whatever, you, you just wait until he's out of office and then, you know, at, at 12.01 on January the 20th when he's done, you then you go arrest him. Well, I, personally, I don't think that's, I don't think that's the way that it should be. And I personally don't think that that is what the, the men at the convention would have envisioned. I, I don't. Right, right. Yes, uh, Jeff. Well, this question that came up to me. Uh, we, we had a vice president, mm -hmm. and somehow it got thrown out, and then we got a, a, a new VP, and, and that was... Uh, Agnew. This was Agnew, Agnew. yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, so, and what was he thrown out was he thrown out or he just decided to leave he, he made a deal he made he a sign yeah. and and his charge i believe was was it tax fraud that it actually ended up being and that was part of it that means yeah. black bribery was part yeah of and there was some corruption in there but you know basically him resigning and then going away uh you know was sort of a compromise to not going to jail, you know. Well, I mean, didn't uh, didn't Nixon himself leave office because he didn't yeah. want to be impeached? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's you know, I mean, that's the difference between some of those folks before and Trump was when some people have been caught in the end. It's it's sort of been accepted, and if people don't agree with this, I can understand that. But it's sort of been accepted that look, if you if you sort of come to the understand that you, your career is over. Mm -hmm. And you just walk away from this, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, you no know? criminal charges. And yeah. and I can understand 
people saying that's not well, good in enough. fact if you remember uh, gerald ford was famous for having pardoned nixon in spite of the fact mm -hmm. that he wasn't convicted of anything you mm -hmm. know? yeah and he had, but he was that's a good debate he was intentionally it was it was obvious that he that nixon was going to be thrown out he was going to be impeached for one. He, he was, was going to be kicked out. Well, you see, he took he managed to bite the bullet rather than be impeached. Yes. Trump didn't bite the bullet rather than be impeached. In fact, he didn't bite the bullet twice. Well, he well right. <laughs> but at least if it's Nixon was a, if your buddy uh, uh, Trump was was president the second time. Mm -hmm. Uh, everybody else could say, "Well, well, we want to throw him out of here, or we want to, we want to uh, arrive, you know, turn him to prison, or I don't know what, whatever they said to Nixon, well, they could if, say the if, same." If if Trump had become president a second time, none yeah. of these things would have happened. There wouldn't have been a January sixth, and there wouldn't have been a bunch of documents going to Mar-a-Lago, <laughs> at least at this point. No. Nope. Yeah. But uh, he lost, and uh, he got caught with his pants down, you know. Yeah. Um, Several times a day. Yeah, and and <laughs> his whole you know the whole basis for his argument on why he didn't do anything wrong is the uh, the dog ate my homework defense, you know. <laughs> uh, you know, but it it's it's going to be interesting. I mean, we've never we've really never seen this in our history. Um, yeah, right. So there's not exactly, you know, like, I don't have black and white answers that I can guarantee, you know, that's, you know, how it should be or whatever. It's not, all, you know, in some of these scenarios, we don't really have a statute or a constitutional, uh, you know, uh, article or anything that lays this out for us. Um, and part of the reason for that is, again, because some of this stuff just couldn't be fathomed by... Our framers, you know, that, I mean, if anything, they assume that if any kind of a person ever held this office um, in such a reckless manner, that the legislative branch would have ended it. They would have gotten rid of them through the mechanism that they were given, which was impeachment, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. when this document was, you know, outlined, you know, most people, you know, the men in power, even if you didn't like them, uh, or some of the things they did did still have some integrity and some devotion to uh, public good. Well, well public you know, stuff. this is the first. Well, this, the is the, this is the first president we've had that really didn't respect the position. Yeah. He yeah. didn't respect yeah. the office that he held. Yeah. Uh, even you know, as much as you might hate uh, a Bush, as much as you might hate Nixon, as much as you might hate Reagan. I mean, we can go through all of them. They all had respect for the job they were given, mm -hmm. and they didn't violate that job. Mm -hmm. You know, they used it. Uh, they used it for their own, uh, uh, yeah. you know, uh, devices. But yeah, well, you know, one of the uh, seriously though, if you sit down and you read the notes of the convention, or if you just went and read, you know, these scholarly articles about the convention and all that, I think one of the things that you, I know, one of the things you mean you the Constitutional talk. Convention. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things that you would find is that one of the f main elements that the framers hated the most about people in public service was what they called self-aggrandizers, you know? Mm -hmm. People who were in public service for them yeah. and not for the public. And again, you know, the argument that back then the public didn't have, you know, didn't include slaves and all that, I get all that. But I think that's separate from their from their mindset. That was the world that they lived in, and what they hated almost more than anything was people who held public service office to to enrich themselves. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean some of them didn't, but I'm telling you that as a group, that was one of the things that rubbed them the wrong way more than almost do you, anything. Do you think the framers of our Constitution would look at what's happening today and went, "That isn't what we meant"? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's what I'm saying is someone like Trump, you know, I'm quite certain that almost unanimously they would be saying, shame on the legislative branch. How could you not have gotten rid of this person 
and wipe the slate clean. The voters made a mistake. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to. Do you, You're supposed do you to think clean where, that up you when think, you see this nefarious activity and you didn't do it. Do you think where the Second Amendment is concerned uh, that they would today look at it and say, you know something, we did a bad job of writing that? Well, yeah. Well, I'm sure that they definitely would not understand how we let something... I think more than that, though, they would not understand how we let something get out of control and we didn't use the power that they gave us to rectify it. I think that they would say what you said, but I think more importantly what they would say was, we never could have understood what you were seeing, what you were living, what you are experiencing, which is exactly the reason that we gave you mechanisms to adapt to the things that we couldn't see, and you you have not you have not used them. It's it's right. not you know okay. so the it's method the method to use these we gave them to. If you. we wanted to correct the Second Amendment, we have the process by which to do it, right? Sure. Yeah. You yes, know, absolutely. and yet we are not we're not using that process. Yeah, we're really not even trying with yeah. any serious, you know, uh, momentum. I mean, you know, you hear it mentioned here and there, but it's it's. It's not serious. It's not the main issue. I, 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 we spend more time right now in this country arguing over whether or not you can have a drag show at your local municipality's <laughs> county fair than we do about whether you, or not. You know, the, the framers of our Constitution would have said, "What the hell is a drag show?" <laughs> yeah. Oh, you mean like when when Ben Franklin dresses up in drag? You mean that? Yeah. <laughs> While they're all wearing wigs, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, you know, but it it seems to me like we we get there are more people on cable news networks and op eds and things arguing about that issue than there is serious momentum to say, hey, listen, let's let's settle this Second Amendment issue. Let's finally get decide as a public. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to repeal it or anything, but let's. Let's clean up the language. Let's let's make it say what we think as a people, as a society, works for our time and our place. Well, well that's the problem is though that everybody, and you're maybe going to disagree with me when I say this. Look at the Constitution as some kind of God-given gift, uh, and don't realize that its biggest fallacy is it was written in 1776. Well, I would agree that's how people look at it now. Yeah, yeah. I, and, I would and, agree with that. And you. then a lot of the things that did were written for landowners, were written for, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who uh, uh, were not white. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it didn't apply to a lot of people. It just applied to this kind of person that wrote it. Yes, it uh, applied to the society. Mm-hmm in which it existed at the time and as much forward thinking as they could sort of fathom within their lifetime mm -hmm. and that was mm -hmm. the window or the little box that it was placed in so that's how people look at it today as you were saying which i agree with and i think that they would say you know there, some of them even said this i mean uh, many of them said this openly we we're not we are not demigods we do not don't praise us right don't take everything we said as the gospel right take right. everything we said and use it to make it your own right. god we are not prophets mm -hmm. of the constitutional lord and yeah. say you know what i mean yeah. we're not we are just regular men who went into a room and did the best job that we could and they openly said, in fact, we probably failed. We probably well, didn't. Didn't, it didn't, up. didn't Jefferson say that the Constitution was something that should be rewritten every 50 years? Well, he believes, you know, he had some radical ideas on stuff like that. Yeah. You know, which I don't agree with, and many other people didn't either. But, but I mean, there were so many of them that said. <clears throat> It, it will be great if this lasts for a hundred years because the people will probably take it and trash it because we're just we're not that smart we're not that good we did the well, best also we could do. it was of the time you know sure. and and uh, it could have been rewritten but I don't mm -hmm. trust this Congress or anybody else to rewrite it you know yeah, that's, that's the problem if you have it written every 50 years who's gonna write it 
Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, mm -hmm. and if, if you haven't got a bunch of people who learn how to get along with each other and agree with each other on certain issues, mm -hmm. you're never mm -hmm. gonna have a, a constitution uh, that if we let's say we threw out the Constitution tomorrow and said we're going to write a whole new one, we'd be lucky it was written in the next hundred years. They'd be arguing well, well, all the things. So government. Much. <laughs> and if and if we did, okay, and if we did, and we had some provisions in there about transgender stuff and drag shows and uh, well, the other the other stuff. problem was is that the other problem would be that everybody would want their needs taken care of. Yeah. Rather than doing things which are all encompassing for everybody. Yeah. So it's know. not that much different because if we got together and we did that and we took care of it and we wrote it and it, it got ratified and everything's great, hunky dory. But 150 years from now, we may very well probably would have a whole group of people sitting around the panel like this saying, you know, them, them clowns that wrote that stuff 150 years ago. Look at look at some of the stuff they said about transgender people. Look at some of the stuff they said about this and that you know what i mean that they were backwards thinking you know half retarded idiots i don't know how they ever got anything done. and I mean, and you know. and they didn't take mars into consideration <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i mean you know so that's some of the stuff that we do now with you know our own uh thinking on on you know our own framers mm -hmm. but i think if you take if you just take any time. I mean, if, if you, if a person could just one day in their life set aside two or three hours and just do some reading or watch some good YouTube wait, video. Oh, wait a minute. Is, wait a minute. You're asking the American public to yeah. read? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, because I think part of the problem is, you know, that I, I watched this thing earlier and it was from several years ago in a 60 Minutes interview with the historian David McCulloch because we're coming up on the one year anniversary of, you know, when he died. And he, you know, he, he narrated the Ken Burns documentary yeah, right, on the right. Civil War and several others, but he wrote, you know, so many books. And, you know, in this interview, he was just saying that it saddened him as old as he was that there are entire generations of Americans now that he felt were historically illiterate. And he's not blaming them. He didn't say, these. hey, these kids are stupid, they're worthless, they're lazy. He said they're incredibly energetic and, uh, uh, you know, attractive and ready to go. And they, they have all these smarts and they can do all these great things, but they're historically illiterate. Yeah. You know, he said, I, I can't believe that I can go to a college. And he says, it happens every time. And I can give a talk and someone comes up to me at the end and says, you know, before today, I never knew that all the 13 original colonies were all on the East Coast. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, and he just says, you know, what do I say to that? Yeah. You know, he, they're just historically illiterate. So, Well, you know, I don't think that I mean, in do do? general the American public has a desire to know what went on before they were born. Really? And, and I always found that curious to me because I love knowing what went on before I was born. It was yep. fascinating to me. Movies, culture, everything, you know. Yes, Charlie. Yeah, I think if you had a map of the United States with no writing on it and you ask people to identify the states, I don't think I don't think 50% of the people could get half of the states right. I mean that's probably not a bad. Well, would, would you get would you be able to do it uh, without getting mixed up somewhere in the South? Oh yeah, I can name all fifty states. I can. Well, I can. I can, I can name them, but if I had to point to it and say which one is that? Oh yeah, that. Oh, I can. I know what Tennessee looks like. Yeah. Yeah, I know what uh, Florida looks like. I know what most of them look like. I used to be able to tell you every state capital. Really. Yeah. Yeah, but I can't do it now, but I used to be. Well, I, I could, too, for, like, the longest time, and then every once in a while, I'm, now sometimes I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. but that, that one, I admit, I, I slip on that one. I somehow forget yeah. those. But Charlie said 50%, I, though. You know, we just... Yeah. Who said 50%? I, 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 said, I said half the people couldn't even get 50% right. Yeah, right. well, so, I, could, I could get most of We can all get more 50%. 50, 50 yeah. yeah, but I, I think that we have, and I'm not just talking about the 18-year-olds now. I mean, uh, he said, and I agree, several generations yeah. of people who are historically illiterate. You know, like I said, he didn't say they were stupid. 
He just said what they were taught was we failed them. They're yeah, because they don't teach them. civics in school anymore. We used to have all kinds of classes and stuff on how the city government ran, how the state government ran, how the federal government do you ran. Know, do you know, they don't do that anymore. You know what they don't teach in school? I, I've been told. They don't teach kids how to write cursive any longer. No, they don't. Yeah, and th and thank right. God for that, because I tried writing my name in cursive the other day, and I couldn't do it. <laughs> you know, yeah. because so seldom but do I know, have to write part my of the name reason, now. You know, but in my well, hand Part of the is, reason for some of that, that, uh, that he pointed out, and again, I happen to agree with, is, and I know we talked about this before, was that so many of the people who teach your, your kids in public school now, and again, this is not their fault, this is us failing as a system, you know, and he just said, I, he said, I don't think anyone should ever go to college and you get a degree in uh, education or secondary education or uh, pre-K education or whatever. They should go to college and get a degree in a subject. And then they should love that subject. And then they should teach your child that subject with the passion and the experience and the well, life okay, that you they know what I never, What I can never understand is when and as as a person who only has a minimal amount of uh, of uh, a college, uh, actually junior college, um, I could never see why people. Um, there were two two problems here. Number one, why at eighteen years of age we ask kids what they want to study to be. I mean, give them a couple of years off to see what they want to do with their lives. Because I then find these people that go to college and they, they get a degree in archaeology. And then they never use it. Yeah. Okay? So what I are they... I don't use astrophysics. <laughs> what? I don't use astrophysics. Well, but, I but, know you do. But was it, it was, a, uh, it was a, stu a line of study that you fascinated you, right? Yes. Yeah. I'm but I saying, end up working with computers. Yeah, but I'm saying to people like, oh, you're an archaeo you 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 graduated in archaeology. Where are you currently archaeologizing? Yeah. You know, I mean, where are you, where are you digging up bones at this present time? Uh, you know, yes, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, As a father of a 17 and a half year old, mm -hmm. I think that they should go to college at least for for basic stuff, mm -hmm. but. But what are you gonna have the kid do for two years? Can't work at can't work at Baskin Robbins for two years. Right, but on the other hand, uh, what are you gonna do with those kids? Because they they you're you're throwing at them the idea that they have to come up with something they want to do with the rest of their lives and do that at eighteen. No kid knows at eighteen what they want to do. Are you doing now what you wanted to do when you were eighteen? boss people around yep no I, <laughs> <laughs> no I wasn't I was in electronics but see see I went to electronics Academy during high school and they had job placement and they had mentorship so at, at my junior senior summer I worked two jobs I worked AMPM mm -hmm. mini Mart Monday through Friday and I worked Spetcher physics in Mountain View uh, two two days the uh, Saturday Sunday no sorry Monday through Friday and the other one on the weekends and then I worked in my senior year I worked at Hill Packard and I was all through that vocational school. Yeah, but, but that's now that's the other thing. Shouldn't we have more vocational schools? Yes. And let me give you an example. I think doctors, lawyers, should all go to vocational schools. Mm -hmm. I mean, after all, isn't it a vocation? And why, why do they have to go through the full college before they can even start becoming doctors, you yeah. know? Why can't they suddenly go to a vocational school for being a doctor and uh, and that's it? You know, well, and a lot of people now are beginning to wonder whether kids should go to college at all, whether right. that's a good idea for most people. For you some, know. it isn't. For for some, it isn't. I mean, I, I'm a yeah. I'm a supporter of Excuse the. Excuse me, my nose is itching tonight. You know the the vocational route. I took that route in high school when I originally went into. A, uh, a skilled trade, if you will, you know, that still serves me well, you know, today, even though I don't like it, you know, it provides a, you know, a steady opportunity. Well, my father, so, my father always taught me that, oh. that if I wanted to, uh, that uh, uh, the fact that anything I needed to know is in a book somewhere. 
you know. And all I had to do was know what book to fi find it in. You now know, it's on Google. Yeah, now, and now it's on Google. Google. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I mean, but, but, we, we let's get back to cursive. The fact that they're not teaching cursive anymore. Oh, but okay, there is yeah, one finish. other issue also is that my kids you know they have electives you know electives right so there are these other classes that can tr they can try to sign up for mm -hmm. and if they don't get their first one there's a second or third option right mm -hmm. so now you have a kid who's interested in one of those electives and if they don't get in that class now they're being pushed to do something else mm -hmm. like stephanie had to do drama i think her freshman year and she didn't want like drama she didn't want to do drama there was something else that she wanted to do one of the art classes you know, so now you have a kid that's young and actually wants to do something, and then you're pushing them into something else just because they don't have enough room for them in the class. Yeah. Well, you know, all I'm saying is that I think that we have to rethink the whole college thing. We have to rethink uh, uh, what, what, what we, what, why we send kids to college. I mean, if a person wants to be a doctor, maybe they don't know till they're 22, 23 that they want to be a doctor. I mean, some kids do know. I knew what I wanted to be when I was basically what I wanted to be when I was like uh, 15, 14. I wanted Midnight to, Blue? No, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted I think to be, we all wanted to do that. <laughs> I wanted to be the king of pornography, yes. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, I, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to be in show business. I didn't know what kind of show business exactly. Uh, my father was a musician. He tried to teach me some instruments. I never learned any. Um, and then I just, I at fourteen, uh, I did a ra local radio high school high school radio show, and I knew then and there I, what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I knew really early, but I was lucky. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, um, uh, Charlie, did you always know what you wanted to do with your life? Uh, yeah, I always I knew from probably the age of ten that I wanted to be a scientist. That I wanted to study science. Okay. I decided to high school that it was going to be astronomy and astrophysics. Why did you decide that? As a, I mean, there's a lot of science out there that you could have yep. picked from. Why? Why was that? Because it generally incorporates all of the sciences. Because you have to know some chemistry, you know, to figure out what's going on in, in planets and planetary atmospheres. You have to know some physics because of what's going on in the interior of stars. Uh, you know, you have to know some biology if you're going to study the possibility of life on other planets. So it covered all the science. I think if I hadn't gone to, um, if I hadn't gone into radio at a very early age, that my other choice would have been science. You know, because I was always fascinated by science too, and technology and so on and so forth. But at my time when I was growing up. We didn't really have a term called technology. I mean, it just wasn't a, an area of expertise. Um, but uh, yeah, yes, Jeff. Unmute Jeff. Unmute Jeff. Okay. Um, when I was uh, before high school, that would be in grade school. Yeah, you know, <laughs> they had they had the third year, right? You know, uh, what the heck they call that? It didn't matter. But anyway, a friend of mine said, <clears throat> he says, you know, I'm going to apply for this Brooklyn Tech group. And we're going to, I says, what's it, what's it about? He says, well, you know, we're going to learn engineers and stuff like that and physics and, and math and, and manufacturing products and all these things. And but you have to take a test. Yeah. And then oh, you know, there's like I don't know, six thousand guys who are gonna apply for this. Right. And only two thousands are gonna get it. Based upon the smartest guys on that test. So I was one of those who passed the test. Yeah, right. Okay. You know. You know? And then I went there and it was fantastic. It was, you know what? I wasn't that happy with school or everything every time. But I knew this was the area where I, I'm i learning and I want to continue to learn on this. Yeah. I want to go to college and I want to take courses in engineering and physics and this. Yeah. 
Yeah, all the same kind of things. And and it was great. And then they ended up giving me a job. Yeah. Uh, Alan? So in high school, I was really good in science also. And so I thought maybe I wanted to go into medicine, maybe the research end of it, if not become, I don't know, something in medicine. Not pediatrics, because kids drove me nuts. But um, yeah, but I would want to be a pediatrician. And I'll, I had I'll, really good, I had I'll, really I'll, good I'll, grades. No, but my I'll, parents... tell you, I'll tell you why I would be a, want to be a pediatrician. Okay. Uh, it's because there. I've talked to doctors, and they say you know it's the one branch of medicine where, for the most part, it's a happy profession. Because you're, you know, mothers are giving birth to children and you're helping them get the kid. Occasionally there's a kid who drops dead on you, but basically pediatricians have a pretty nice, happy line of work. Whereas, you know, who wants to be an oncologist for crying out loud? Yeah. I blow my brains out. But go so, ahead. So, yeah, so, you know, I went into microbiology. You don't know. I mean, you know, that I, I, I got a degree in microbiology and at the same time was taking biology, but I wanted to go to work. And a friend of mine would be, uh, was a police officer, a family friend, and so <laughs> yeah, I got, went, into law enforcement. went into yeah. law enforcement, and I got my degree in microbiology, but no degree in biology. And then, you know, I, my parents had connections at Stanford University, we lived right across the bay. And my parents weren't too happy, but I did that. And then by the time I got hurt on the job and everything. A lot of time had gone by, and uh, I would have had to go back through it all over again mm -hmm. and become the oldest doctor in the world at fifty or something. Mm -hmm. But I was I was happy with the sciences. I was I was good at them, and uh, you know the science is always ever evolving. So I wanted to cure cancer. My grandmother died of cancer, and I thought maybe. You know, I could I could uh, do some oncology, become an oncologist, and work in a in a science lab and cure cancer. Now we all know that how difficult that is saying that, but well, because we we, we 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 do know now that cancer is not just one disease. Yes, you know. absolutely. Mm. So, and, and, yeah. but we are saving lives because we're now treating them as individual diseases. You know, so anyway, so. You know, I mean, uh, but uh, I, I just, uh, I, I, going back to our original thinking here, uh, you know, the fact is that the original framers of our Constitution built a Constitution to their needs. And now it's how many years later? I'm sorry. You know, doesn't, doesn't work. It isn't, needs, that what, isn't that what Gavin Newsom wants to do? With the Twenty Eighth Amendment, yes, he would like. I'm not, gonna, to. I'm not disputing it. I think it's a good idea. Yeah. Uh, but he wants to build it to our needs. Yeah. Right. And our needs are that we need to reel in the Second Amendment somewhat. And we need to quit killing each other. Well, that's hmm. unfortunately. I mean, I would, I would just say, you know, that it works. You know. And it fits our needs and our time by and large, you know, in, in the overwhelming majority of it. But there are small areas of it that uh, just aren't relevant for the world that we live in. But that it is what it is until we decide we, we'd love to do something else with it. You know, I mean, uh, ideally, mm -hmm. this would be the power that resides in the people. And we yeah. uh, we've given it over to to others you know we we haven't taken it up okay. i mean i know it's a dead horse for me but that's yeah uh by, by the way we have scott Boddicker here and scott promised us that he was going to take us out tonight well we just lost him so <laughs> <laughs> he took us out <laughs> uh he'll call back he'll call back uh probably would press unmute and he, he hung up <laughs> yeah, probably mm. well the trouble is when you use a cell phone to do your zoom yeah. You have so little real estate to work with, yep. you know, uh, that it's it's not easy. It's not easy. But uh, um, anyway, um, I don't know. Better than nothing. I just, yeah. you know, I get very, I get very depressed about the times we're living in, you hmm. know. And there's no reason for me to be depressed because I'm at my life's end, towards the end of my life. Put me, I could live another, you know. 
another 15 years or something like that if I live as long as Tony Bennett yeah uh, you know but I don't think I will and I shouldn't really care I really shouldn't care but it does bother me I mean it bothers me I don't live in San Francisco anymore but the fact that San Francisco has problems doesn't mean that I don't care about San Francisco and its problems uh, and the same is true of this country you know I, I hate to see something that I was brought up to believe a certain ideal about what this country was and uh, and and not have it live up to that expectation you know and but Alex, in, in, in your life you've always been right they said the youth guru and all that stuff but I mean is this just a different level of all that that you saw before well you know if I were to go back and say has it ever been as bad as it is now I'd have to say no from the standpoint of divisiveness between people okay who can't seem to agree on anything but were things worse at other times uh, I lived through the McCarthy era I lived through the House on American Activity subcommittee that was some pretty horrible stuff you know and uh, uh, it, it, it bothers me when I see it rear its ugly head today in many ways I consider the Me Too movement to be a lot like McCarthyism because was that uh, people would suddenly are, uh, are you now or have you ever been a sexist <laughs> you know and uh, all of a sudden if it was shown that at one point you were a sexist they didn't take you to court to prove it or anything like that but you just never worked again you know I mean look at Louis CK you know although he he works uh, uh, auditoriums and, and 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 places like that and does very well because he has a real following because there's some people who say hey you know this guy had something to say mm -hmm. um, and he admitted to his mistake and let's get on with it but TV networks won't hire him you know late night talk shows won't put him on the air you know so I mean uh, uh, what what's the difference between that and McCarthyism and I uh, when McCarthyism existed in the House on Amer and the whole House on American Activities subcommittee which were two entirely different things mm -hmm. uh, both existed within a certain time frame I think it was one of the ugliest parts in the history of this country mm -hmm. I think it was the time when we gave completely gave up on democracy you know and when I saw that and I visually saw it and I also went through it I said this should never happen again you know and it's happening again but in a different way it has a different flavor now it has a different re uh, reason for existence and I consider the whole Me Too movement to be very much like McCarthyism uh, and and other such things yes uh, Charlie yeah the, uh, the way you feel about that is the same way I feel about uh, Roe v. Wade because uh, I grew up in the 60s and 70s when Roe v. Wade hadn't happened yet and we all knew people that had been butchered or whatever in some back alley abortion. I got a girl mm. pregnant and we, yeah. we were looking for ways to get an abortion and the only thing you could get was some guy with, with a coat hanger in, a, in an alley somewhere. Yeah. You mm. know? So we kept saying never again when once it got Roe v. Wade got through the Supreme Court but look what happened now. 50 years well, later, take it away. we were. Well, I mean, they, uh, they, what's happening to women, they have some women down in Texas now, as you know, yeah. who are suing the state of Texas for not letting them have abortions. And, and these women have been testifying as to what happened to them because they couldn't get an abortion. Mm -hmm. Women who went septic, all kinds of things, you know. And, and they're breaking down, crying on the stand. I mean, it's some really emotional testimony. Yeah, and well, they not they can count the women that have actually physically died since that yeah, rule went but, into but, that law went into place. But nobody even cares about that. No. You know, I think we should care. I think it's just it call me cruel and unusual, but I think a human life that is here and now yeah. should be protected over one that has yet to exist. Hmm. Okay, and and I just think that anybody that needs an abortion especially for health reasons should get one but I mean it's 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 like 
do we have to keep going backwards? I mean, is that the name of the game now? You go backwards? And then do we go forward? Yeah, well, the question is, can we ever go forward again, Josh? You know? Well, we can, and, you know, I think we will when the, when the, when the people decide that the people will decide, that, that they will no longer allow nine people who were two steps removed from their own choosing to make decisions for them anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, we abdicate our power to Congress, and then ca Congress abdicates that power to the court mm -hmm. um, because they can hand it off to people who don't have to be elected, and then they can create a firestorm around it to ensure that they get reelected. It's a bit well, of a scam, well, well, to be honest with well, you. Well, my feeling is is that what what you've got to do is a proactive thing, and where abortion is concerned, I don't think that all these clinics should shut down. I think they should keep working, and if they get arrested hmm. for it, clog up the courts so that nothing really, you know, they. It, it, in mm -hmm. other words, it, as long as people say, okay, well, you say we have to close them down, we'll close them down, well, it's never going to turn around. You yeah, know, well, that is a bit of a civil rights type of playbook. So, I mean, you know, that's a... I mean, if I were a doctor, uh, I, in, I'd i say, okay, I've made a lot of money already in my lifetime. I've already got my yacht and everything. <laughs> I'm going to do abortions. Mm -hmm. Because I... And then I'm going to let them arrest me, and then I'm going to take them to court and fight this thing. That's, that's a bit of a playbook from that. So, I mean, that could work, but... The, but nobody's doing it. They're all buckling right. down and going, well, we can't and, do and, abortions. And, that, and that's why, you know, I argued before that abortion apparently is just not as important to people as people would have you believe, as the media or others would have you believe. I mean, the media had you believing that if Roe v. Wade were overturned, that the people would just, they would just never accept that. It would just be pure insanity and, you know, well, none of that happened. But that's what, not what we were told, but almost nothing happened. I mean, there were some pretty big rallies right after, and then, you know, they threw their cold water on that, and it sort of went away. Yeah. Now, there have been some election consequences. Yeah. In, I mean, absolutely, you know, uh, Kansas and all. So maybe it's coming. So that's what I'm saying. Are the people waking up? If that's the case, mm -hmm. good. That's what they should do. That, I mean, that, that's, that's how they should be reacting. I didn't see the fever pitch for it like instantly like I heard we were going to so maybe it's a slow boil here you know I mean I hope so right because we should be making these decisions for ourselves we as society should not have went to nine people in Washington DC and said please settle this dispute for us yeah that should have been encoded in law correct I agree but yeah, both well, well, sides both sides had the opportunity to do so for 50 years or more, and neither one of them did it. Yeah, but you they, know, we, we you, know? It, you know, it it seems ridiculous to me that the Supreme Court, one Supreme Court, a few years ago, 50 years ago, created Roe versus Wade or hmm? voted on Roe v. Wade and and made abortion legal in this country, and then all of a sudden, 50 years later, the Supreme Court can take it away. I don't know if that's exactly right. I mean, once you just make a decision on an issue, you move on to other issues. You never go back to that one to then, in retrospect, say, oh, well, we were wrong. Let's turn it around the other way. Well, I mean, that's a reasonable and fair point. Uh, I mean, I don't think it can ever, you know, too much work that way because, you know, I mean, you know, there have been decisions that were overturned in that same manner mm -hmm. that I think we all would agree were positive outcomes, you know. Uh, I mean, you know, the Supreme Court once said in the Dred Scott decision that a black person wasn't a human being and had no rights. Mm -hmm. You know, and later courts, you know, had to, to say, mm, not so much. You know, the same with, you know, Brown, you know, Brown v. Board of Education and and you know plus E.V. Ferguson and and you know separate but equal and so on and so forth so I mean the court can right wrongs I think that we politically in our minds don't see that that's what they did this time however there is a large contingent of Americans who do see it that way 
I mean, I, I know plenty of people who think that that, you know, they pop some champagne, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah. but there are pockets of that throughout the country here and there. And that's, I mean, I guess that's what I'm saying is that's my point is the disagreement is there. And we went to a mediator and we asked them to mediate it for us. And when they got done mediating it, not everyone was happy, which probably means they did a good job because yeah. that's their only choice. I mean, that's yeah. what I said weeks ago was we asked Solomon for his wisdom. And when he cut our baby in half, we cried, you know, uh, but the, the key point was we asked, you know, well, how many, Solomon, the, how many of these people, into the house? How many of these people that voted against abortion on the Supreme Court when they were giving their testimony before Congress to get their job yeah. all said the same thing? Well, you know, this is mm -hmm. uh, this is law. We're not going to change established law. Yeah. And then they changed established law. They I did, mean, how right. do you take a law that has existed for 50 years that women in this country have depended on for their health, for their well-being, mm -hmm. and, and also, let's say, for the well-being of their children because maybe they didn't want to have another child and they already had two, and they felt mm -hmm. they couldn't afford another one, okay? Mm -hmm. And only wanted to have the amount of kids that they could afford. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they live with this for 50 years, and all of a sudden it's yanked out from under them. This isn't something that was, uh, you know, that existed and then they decided it was illegal. Mm -hmm. This is something that was decided illegal by the Supreme Court, and they shouldn't have been allowed to take it away. They, no, they, they, they shouldn't have, but we let them. Well, how what happens if the court decides yeah. that, hey, those anti-slavery laws are now, those are, those are, illegal now you can go back to slavery i mean the, you know the good news is we have those codified in in you know amendments which are rock solid you know so mm -hmm. but but he's right to the point that we cannot we cannot give them that opportunity we have to decide this stuff amongst ourselves and that can only be done through our elected representatives and then our executive signing off Right. You know, and that's how we have to do it. And if and if the abortion issue really is in the hearts and minds of Americans that important of an issue, then we should be finding that out coming up, you know, next year. Next year. You know, and, and it should it should be at the forefront. I mean if 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 Biden has any sense uh, you know he will take the words of Marjorie Taylor Greene yesterday, the day before, where she's sitting around saying, oh, he's just trying to continue the legacy of FDR and LBJ and Medicare and Medicaid. <laughs> and he, I would just fucking play it. I would play it before every fucking rally. I would yeah. play it at the end of every fucking rally. And I would find out exactly how many fucking times we could play it on television in all 50 states. Yeah, I right. fucking have that shit. On a kid, if you're going to see Oppenheimer tonight, you ain't watching that fucking movie until that fucking bitch has had her say. And here's what the fuck she had to say. <laughs> How that fuck? I mean, that's exactly what he should do. And yeah. also, and also, I there, agree. Also, there's no Barbie for you either. Well, that's yeah. communist propaganda, and I'm a real American. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, it, 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 we've kind of run out of time here. I'm going to play the theme any second now, but it's it. It's, all these things just disappoint me. You know, why we even have to be arguing these things? Why we can't just be decent human beings and treat other people like decent human beings? I often said there should only be one law, and that law should be don't do anything that hurts somebody else. That's all you need. That's the only law you need. And, and uh, we'd be a lot better world if we just lived by that mantra. But anyway, am I being... Am I being uh, naive, I guess? Naive, yeah. No. Okay. Hey, listen, My mother would listen say that. Jeff, thank you uh, for being with us tonight. I appreciate it. Really? Uh, um, and uh, uh, Alan, thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Charlie. And thank you, Josh, because uh, you always bring to this program a certain intelligence that it otherwise wouldn't have. Okay? And I, th I thank you for bringing that to our doorstep. Anyway, everybody, I want you to give a big wave goodbye to everybody, and I'll give a big wave goodbye at you, okay? There they go, ladies and gentlemen. That's our citizen panel for tonight, and that's the citizen panel for this week. Well, there's one coming up on the uh, January.
Jack Bishop intersection, which is next over most of the same GabNet. And he'll be taking your calls on Skype at GabNet Live. GabNet Live. Now, I want each and every one of you to have a very nice weekend. And uh, keep yourself cool. And don't leave any pets or kids in the car. And I just want to see you all be better. Uh, and, uh, and not lose any of you. I need every member of this audience I can get. So let's live through this heat, and we'll come out the other side of it, and it'll be winter, and then we'll be snowed up to our ass. Okay, anyway, we'll see you again on uh, Monday uh, with the, uh, the pop-up show. That'll be on, uh, let's see, on Facebook Live. And then we'll see you right back here again next uh, Wednesday. Same time, same station in life. In the meantime, as always, if you see her, tell her I love her. Have a nice weekend, everybody. <laughs>